Hang on, I'm not in the group, of course. It takes a little bit longer. Welcome to my channel. Oh, stop that. <laughs> I hate that. Auto right, it's definitely live on YouTube. It says my screen, you're in a practice session. I don't know. Yeah, I haven't done that yet. Um, okay. That's just the last thing I have to do. Um, but I'm just wondering, are we there in Facebook? Uh, Can't see yeah, it. There we are. And I can pin that now to featured. And then I change Zoom to start webinar and that'll start recording. I just do that last thing because if I'm going to start recording, then Astrid has to cut all the beginning bit out while we're just talking to each other. Um, so that's it. I've got closed captions on. Hi, everybody. We are now. Hang on. I can, I can pin that. Just getting ourselves sorted out. We're a few minutes early, but we thought we would just make sure that we can see you all and that you can see us. So let me close that. I can see everybody coming in on YouTube and everybody coming in on Facebook. And uh, Donna is also checking Facebook. We're going to split it between us. So um, I have with me, as you can see, Donna Morris. Um, Donna is another one of my coaching teams. So the other day you saw Anne. And Donna is here to help me keep on top of all the questions. And we're, we're going to just get to as many things as we can. But obviously, we don't go through every single question. So as I said last time, we'll try and... We'll try and pick questions that we feel are useful to everyone. And we kind of pick up on that from going through the Facebook group and the emails. We have a sense of where everybody is. So if you have like a question that's very personal to you, it's probably better to email us fyjteam at gmail.com or reply to any of the emails that you get from us. We see those things. Um, but in the big group, it's nice to answer something that everyone can benefit from. Uh, lovely to see everyone piling in. Really nice number of people coming in. Hi, hi, hi. Hi from all over the world. Um, Roberta is just asking, how do I move forward? I seem to be stuck doing the same things. I'm interested in what, what you mean by that, Roberta, because the assignments have been two very different things the abstract painting all over the squares and then the using lots of different instruments and colors that you're not comfortable with. So in theory, you shouldn't have been able to do the same things because today's uh, yesterday's assignment was to actually do all the different things. So is it a case that you haven't done those yet or do you mean more in general? I'm not sure, but these assignments, and before we get into the questions, I'm just going to, let me just do a change here so that it's, you're just seeing me while I'm speaking. Uh, but you see, for some reason, is everyone seeing me or are you seeing Donna? At, at the moment, on I the can screen, see you. you can see, yeah, yeah. I, I see you. I switched to speak of you, but I see you. And that isn't that okay. Now it's me, but I'm not seeing you even in a small, but okay, good. I talk right. goes to me. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's what I was expecting to happen. But initially, I just saw you, but okay. I'm happy not being screen, but it's up to you. Oh, excuse me, everybody. Uh, I've lost my train of thought totally anyway. So, what I wanted to do first is just have a little chat about what's been going on the last day or two. And then we'll go to questions. So I'll try and keep my chat pretty short. But the way I like to do it is to kind of look at everyone's experience of the assignment. And then I make some notes during the day as I'm thinking about it, about what I want to say. <clears throat> and there's something I wanted to clarify that few people might be confused about. Someone in the group or in an email, I can't remember which, asked me, but surely there's such a thing as bad art and good art. How can you say that all art is good? And if anyone else is confused about that, I just wanted to clarify. I am not saying that all art is good, whatever good means. Um, I'm saying that the way to good art is to stop caring so much about every painting being good. I'm saying that the artists who are considered good, the ones who are recognized in the art world and who are in galleries and who even the really big ones who change the world like 
Jackson Pollock or Picasso. These people were not worried about making mistakes. They were seeking mistakes. They were trying and pushing things and trying new things. They had piles of mistakes. The trying to make a good picture every time is what kills you when you're trying to move your art forward. And I loved that in the comments in Facebook and in the emails, lots and lots and lots of people are observing what's happening inside them when they're painting and saying, you know, I, I get tense and tight when I'm tr- I, I start thinking I'm wasting paint. I start thinking this isn't going well. I start thinking I haven't got any talent. And imagine if Picasso was trying, he he was interested in uh, finding a new way to express the way we look at things. And he was trying to invent what became cubism. But he said, you know, I, I, I'm trying to invent this new thing, but I really don't want to mess up, really don't want to do anything that doesn't look good. Or Jackson Pollock, the two I mentioned at the beginning, he's trying to find a new way of working. He's trying to find a way to put his whole body into his painting. But at the same time, he's telling himself, but there's a gallery that wants three paintings and and this one has to be good and I've got a commission and I don't want my wife to think I'm not a very good painter. So I better try and get everything right. If they had that mindset, obviously modern art wouldn't have moved forward in the way that it did. And so that is what I'm asking you to do. I'm not saying every every piece of art is a good piece of art. I'm saying everyone here, everyone here has the capacity and capability and talent and ability to personally express themselves if they want to, if they want to learn, if they want to push the ideas in the way we're doing in this free workshop. You all have that ability wherever you are starting, even if you were, even if you've never painted until this course, everyone has the ability ability to express themselves, but you need to be open. First of all, before we even get into teaching you all the technical principles and stuff that we teach in the full course, we have to get you to the point where you understand that being free and experimenting is the way to get where you want to go. Um, Picasso actually said, and I put this quote in the lesson video, every child is an artist. The problem is how to remain an artist once we grow up. And this is exactly what he meant, that we become concerned with other people's opinions and we want to show off a little bit and we want to succeed, whatever we mean by that. And, And therefore we lose the true artistry of a child. And our job as artists is to spend our lives trying to get back to what we had when we were six. Um, and, And if there's one thing I teach that is harder to grasp than anything else, it's this idea of in order to truly express yourself and make exciting work, you have to stop trying to make exciting work. It seems counterintuitive, I know, but it is so true. It's very easy for me Later in the course, we uh, the full course, sorry, we teach color and how to mix amazing colors and how to make colors look great together. We teach composition. We teach how to um, have an intention and turn that into something or how to work intuitively and then bring an intention out of that. We teach um, tone, uh, the darkness and lightness of things. All these things are easy to teach because they're, It's a bit like maths. Art's not really like maths, but there are certain facts that I can show you. I can show you how two colors work together and what they do to each other and how that has an effect on you when you look at a painting. It's so much harder to teach this bit, this bit of you must let go in order to be successful. You must accept failure in order to be successful. And what I'm so proud of in this group is so many people are doing that. And and I'm especially proud, I suppose, of the people who find it difficult and the people who are saying, um, this was really stressful for me, but I pushed through. And actually after half an hour, I started to really have a good time. Or I found, I noticed that voice in my head that was nagging at me and I went on anyway, because once you notice what's going on up here, 
and you start bringing it out into the open, it's no longer got the same power over you and it slowly starts to dissipate its power. It takes longer than a few days, so don't beat yourself up if you are one of those people, but it is completely doable. We have seen literally at this point thousands of people do that, so you can do it too. Everyone can do it. And the last quick thing that I want to say is it's um, somebody asked a question and this came in by email. It's Jessica. Jessica was asking, am I looking for what I like to look at or what I like to do? Which is a really good question because she said sometimes they're not the same thing. And it's whichever one brings you joy, Jessica. So if Doing something that feels good, if when you look at it, you really doesn't feel good to you anymore, then it's not that. It's always following what feels good. At the end of Jessica's question, she said, I love leaving white, but I think I'm I think I'm using that as a crutch and I need to figure out how to successfully fill the page. Is that a rush to a result or is that simply a preference that I ought to allow myself? Whenever you have a preference, you should allow yourself. That's Write that in big letters and put it on the wall of wherever you work. Choose what you love. Drop what you don't love. Over and over and over again. If we were to be working in a studio together and I gave one of you a palette knife and one of you a brush. Oh, sorry. I gave you both a palette knife and a brush. And then I let you both get work in. There are two of you in my studio with me. One of you might choose the palette knife and one of you might choose the brush and neither of you are wrong. So it's just about what are your preferences. And in art, we're constantly choosing. I like this pink. I don't like that pink. I love green. I like blue. I like a big brush. I like a small brush. I like palette knives. I hate palette knives. I like working with my hands. I hate my hands getting messy. It doesn't matter which one of those is you because they're all right. Every single preference you could have is right. It's right for you and therefore it's right. So that's the end of my little sermon. Let me come back into Zoom and bring Donna back on screen, but you were there anyway. I don't know why you were back there again. So we will stop that speak of you, I think, and just keep us both on screen. Um, so do you have any questions that you found, Donna, while I quickly scan YouTube? Just having a quick look. Um, oh, I just took a quick screenshot because they fly past so quickly. Um, I know it's it difficult, isn't it? Interesting uh, comment from Teresa Malone. She said she has ADHD and her brain nat- is naturally wired to rush and seek instant gratification. So she's wondering if you had any tips and tricks to help. Well, I'm I'm certainly not qualified to talk about ADHD. I have no idea. Um, so I'll just say that right up front. So it might be a really good question for the Facebook group because I'm positive that there will be other people with that problem. I thought I might have it because I don't concentrate very well, but I did one of those online tests and I got like one out of 20. So I don't think I I don't think I do. Um I think, though, that as with everyone else, it is a case of finding a way for yourself to to, to do the work to get where you want to go or stay in where you are. And I don't think you want that. So, for example, if you need instant gratification, can you find the gratification in the process and not in the result? Because that's where I get my gratification from in my in my art practice it's not when I finish a painting there is a nice feeling to that too but that's very short-lived my favorite times are the times I've really got engrossed in my painting and time's flown by and I get relaxed because painting's like meditating for me so the craziness in my brain dies away and I feel like I've had a really good bath after I've had one of those sessions. And I think it's about finding finding that gratification, finding it in the process and not in the result, I would say. 
Here's one for you, Donna. I want to ask you this one because you paint representationally sometimes or semi-representationally. Julia on YouTube is asking, my daughter said my self-portrait doesn't look like me. I don't care, but is it possible to learn how to get a likeness? I usually paint totally abstract landscapes. Is it possible? I find, yeah, I, I find that when I do get a likeness, um, it's often when I paint someone I know really well, um, but but then I often paint people I know. Um, but also, it depends where you can get a visual likeness, like a technical likeness, just by making sure the eyes, nose and mouth are kind of at the right distance, because that influences what you look like. But actually, you can sometimes get the essence of someone by, you know, the kind of brush strokes and the kind of feeling you get from it so they're two different ways you want to almost like copy a photograph and if you get it absolutely accurate it will look like that person but if you paint more kind of in terms of your emotions and more expressively it might not look like that person but it might give the feel of that person might feel like them yeah yeah I was just looking at a, a really amazing book by an artist called Emily Ball I don't know if you know this book, Donna, but she wrote a book, I think it's called Painting People. And she has in there, I was just reading it, and it's all these different exercises you can do of ways to paint people that isn't strictly drawing them accurately. And it's really interesting. I can't wait to try some of them. The Um, the thing I would say is, sorry. I was just going to say, I actually did a course with her a couple of months ago, Emily Ball, an online thing. Um, and she had us, so she, you'd call it kind, not exactly abstract, but a bit abstract what she does. She had a smudge and a big thing of charcoal and then kind of just minimalist, you know, like an eye. And, and funny yes. enough, one of them actually looks a bit like me, which was really weird because it was totally kind of different. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it, that was really interesting. Yeah, she, I think that's one of the things she has in the book. One of the exercises in the book is is that one. Yeah, it was re- it's a really interesting book. But I would say for anyone who's interested in drawing very realistically, you just want to get the eyes in the right place and the nose. You can learn to do that. Absolutely. But it's about I think it's about learning to see more than it's about learning to draw. And one of the cool ways that I learned, I mean, I always drew as a kid, but I, I took life drawing classes near me, just in a local uh, local teacher doing life drawing with a model that came in for two hours in the evening. That is so great if you can do that. And there are online life drawing classes as well now. I think it's better in person because because the model's a lot bigger, so you can really see them. Um But that's a good way to learn or just drawing the things around you, drawing a cup on the table, drawing, you know, something in your garden, drawing all the time and practicing seeing, practicing Uh, focusing on what you're looking at rather than what you're drawing is a key thing, I think. Yeah, with people, it's really important as you're drawing in your head, don't say, oh, the curve of the nose goes like this, the eyes like this, you think oh that's a diagonal line or you know you've got yeah. a, not a face that's why yes. if it's a face in a weird position really weird angle um it's I find it easier because you totally disassociate and you just draw yeah. what you rather than what you think you can see I remember the life drawing teacher on one of my first classes I said I cannot get that foot right and she said stop thinking of it as a foot just look at the shapes and all of a sudden with a few lines I had a foot because as soon as you stop trying to fill it in yeah so it's about looking isn't it yeah really interesting exercise um is to if say copy a picture or something turn it upside down and then copy it right Um, and then you'll be surprised put it or even there's an exercise where you um grid up the whole thing just look at one little square at a time upside down so you do like weird little lines and then you turn up the right way and you're amazed at what you've done yeah yes yeah because you again taking your head out of it and that goes to this comment by chris who says my greatest frustration is that what is in my head color composition interesting marks never ever show up on the paper i want to learn how to move from imagination to hands and paper right the problem chris is 
that you've got something in your head, right? And especially with what we're doing in this course, you're not supposed to have anything in your head to start off with. Your head is the problem. So what you need to do is forget what's in your head and instead start experimenting the way I'm showing you because you will learn about color and composition and interest in marks in the process. I mean, in the main course, we are going to teach all of that stuff in different ways, but we're still going to be focused on fun experimentation, trying new things. We're not going to be doing like, right, here's the rules and here's what you do, because that is the way to learn. But the way, but if I never start with something in my head. I'm, I might have a subject. If I'm doing, say, a self-portrait, I might think, right, I'm going to paint my own face. And maybe I think I'm going to start with blue as the main color. But that's as far as it goes. After that, it starts to develop. And then I might think, actually, it's going to be mainly green. And actually, it's not going to be accurate at all. It's going to be a blind portrait. And also, I might splodge some paint right in the middle of it and see how that looks. Um, so, so it's really about getting out of your head and into your hands and your body and the paint and just letting things happen. Um. Well, there's a good question. Let me just, just take a screenshot because they fly past. Um, from Lean or Lenny. Um, they've just said a couple of times lately, I've started painting and I really loved the first draft, but then I couldn't move on because I get scared of destroying what I love, which is already in the painting. Yeah. So I know what you're going to say, destroy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to say, first of all, destroy it. And I'm going to say destroy it because... Or I'm going to be kind and say, I'm going to allow you to put that one aside and do some more. It's but how much they love in the painting. If they love the whole painting and keep it. Yeah. If they love some of it, but hate a little bit of it then. Yeah. You've got to keep going. <laughs> I mean, the thing is, the reason why you feel that way, that you don't want to destroy it. I mean, like Donna says, if you love it, you love it. Put it aside, put it in a frame, put it on your wall. That's fantastic. But you have this feeling that you can never do this again. Like, oh my God, I made something good. Oh my God, hang on to it. I don't want to spoil that because I made something good. But the more you paint and the more you experiment and the more you learn, the more you will understand that you have an endless supply of creativity inside you that never, ever dies. Sometimes it goes to sleep for a bit. Sometimes it has a rest, but it always comes back. And you can make as many good things as you want. So we've all been precious about what we made at the beginning. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If you're brave enough to destroy it, I'd love it. But if you want to keep it, I, I totally understand too. Just I want you to make 10 more if that's the case so that you've got lots to choose from and you can see what's possible. Um, I have... Claude above says, I love wearing bright colors and having a colorful interior, but I'm so scared of bright colors in my painting. Um, I think this is something I was like, too. I'm not so much of a bright color person, as you can see. However, um, I used to paint in black and white, draw and paint in black and white. And that was because I was scared of color. I didn't know how to use it, basically. So I, I didn't know how to mix color. I, I didn't know what to do with it. So I stuck to black and white because it was easier. And that was all right. I did that for a while. And then eventually I felt like, OK, I want to try a bit of color. And I put maybe two colors into the, the black and white. And then I went full color because I got confident. And actually now I'm going more monochrome again. So I don't know. Maybe that's really me. But it is just baby steps. Don't don't. A lot of these questions have an underlying thing feeling behind them of oh my god I'm not there yet oh my god oh my god and I understand it I do because I felt like that too but it is you have you have time you just paint you just you just paint and it comes it doesn't all happen at once if it was easy to paint really exciting paintings then everyone could do it and what would be the point of us but it, it, we're the ones who are willing to put the work in to get to the point of being good. And that is an amazing thing because it gives us 
a lot of exciting things to do. Um, do you have anything at the moment, Donna? Um, there's a lot of um, love of your color mix in video. Just uh, oh, that's good. I'm glad you enjoyed that, everybody. It's interesting when I say um, when I say use three colors and black and white. A lot of times, people think they have to stick to those three colors and not mix them together. And it's okay. I don't. I don't really emphasize that because I want you to get these things slowly because there's a lot to teach and some of the questions we've been asked in emails I simply can't get to in eight days and I'm like I'm sorry that comes in the full course but we can't do it all in eight days so we have to pick what we think is important and I thought the color mixing was important I've got one here from Chantal who says I tend to make mud how do I stop or learn to stop um if you are using acrylic Chantal and even if you're using watercolor you probably well, let's go acrylics first. You're probably not letting the paint dry before you put another layer on top or you are mixing one color into another and it just happens that the colors you've chosen are particularly ones that don't work together, which that's just the way it is. And so they're turning into mud because they're mixing on your paper. So that can be fixed with a hairdryer. So you dry everything you've put down before you put something else down. In watercolor, which I am not very good with, but what used to happen to me is with watercolor, even after it's dry, it lifts again when you put water on it. So if you put the next layer of paint on, you have to be very gentle. Otherwise, you lift the bottom layer and you start making mud again. So that is all that's wrong. You can easily just fix that by just making sure thing, the acrylics are dry and making sure with watercolor that you're very gentle with any additional layers. You can do that. You can put additional layers of watercolor on, but you've got to learn how to do it. Um, um, there's a question. Sorry, I'll just see if I can find it. Oh, while you look for that, I'm just going to do Anne's question, which is, I want to always do something unique and new. That's and what I <laughs> All right. And I always feel like anything I do will be something overdone or not unique, makes me feel trite and boring ideas. Yes, do these exercises and things like this. Like the only way not to be trite and boring. And again, you can't do it right from the off. You can't just say, I'm going to be an artist and I'm going to be unique and exciting. Um, so off I go, <laughs> because maybe you can if you're a genius, but it certainly didn't work that way for me. Don't know about you, Donna. Did it work that way for you? Um, no. You, um, no, well, nothing's original, isn't it? I mean, there's a whole that's still like an artist. What's yeah, but name? did you did you feel like you just started painting one day and everything you did was exciting? No, I used to copy photos and then yeah. think, why am I doing this? <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, no, I still think, um, yeah. I think you still one you, you just got to paint what you enjoy painting and um not think you know um my mum always says to me why don't you paint dog portraits and I'm like well yeah, <laughs> yeah no. I've had that word question I think this is going to sound awful and I don't mean it to sound awful but when we start most of the things we do are trite and boring in this in the sense of we're beginners so when I started, everything I'd done had been done before. Perfect example, I started to do these paintings of cows. I live in the countryside. I'm surrounded by cows. I thought, oh, cows. And I did them in watercolor. And they were quite quirky. And I thought they were unique and original. And then someone said to me, oh, I saw one of your paintings in the pub the other night. And she'd taken a picture. And it wasn't my painting. It was someone else's. But it looked like mine. And then I discovered oh, there's like 1,500 people just in this area painting quirky cows. I'm by far not the only person. So at first, that's what we're like, and that's part of learning. And it goes back to this rush for results, Anne. If you want to be unique and exciting and you want to rush towards that, you will never be unique and exciting. But if you give up, the desire to be unique and exciting right now and you 
go off and do these assignments and experiments. And if you can come study with me more or study with someone else or just work every day on your painting, always experimenting, always trying new things because the new things will spark new ideas and you'll be off. And before you know it really quite quickly, you will be making things that are unique because everyone does if they just follow their own preferences but you've got to that voice that says, this is trite, this is overdone. I find it helpful to just say to myself, all right, then it's trite and overdone. I'm still going to do it because this is where I am at the moment. And when I get further on it, you know, it won't feel like that. Um, Rachel well, says you can buy a heat gun for drying art. I have a heat gun, but I'm scared to put it anywhere near my paintings in case it sets on fire, but I'm a bit timid. Um, I'm just going to go back to YouTube. Um, Sharon, when I asked what I liked about a painting, some intangibles were important to me. Is this too results focused? How is this helpful for the next painting? So... I th again, I think this is a bit of a run before you can walk question, although it's a very good question. But um, intangibles are just as important as tangibles if they're important to you. So what I'm asking you to do in this taster course is to notice how you feel and what you love. And that's exactly what you did, Sharon. You feel like I want to get a sense of introspection in and I know it when I feel it. Right. So that's just fine if that's what matters to you. The only time what matters to you is a problem is when it makes you unhappy or tight or tense or stressed. If it feels good, it's not a problem. Um, Torrid asks, Louise, do you do bodies of work, sell and start a new body of work, or do you just paint and sell on the fly? Personally, recently, I've done a set of paintings and then put them up for sale. I'm quite a slow painter. What about you, Donna? Not that this is related to the course at all, but how do you work? Um, in the past, I used to work one painter at a time, labour over it for ages, and it really mattered. Um, and then after I took your course and... Um, you were talking about painting a few at a time. And so I started doing that. Yeah. And it's great because you can either, if you get a bit bored of one or you get stuck on one, you go on to the other. So I don't know if I'm doing three or four at a time, one of them I might hate, move on to the others, mess another one up, hate that, but then go back to this one and like that, you know, and it's, it doesn't matter as much. So you're a bit more daring. Yes. Because you think, well, if yes. I mess up these other ones that are going well. So yeah, def and plus it helps they sort of work I don't know if you're using the same colour palette or a yes. similar sort of theme, they kind of sit together well. Yeah, and you just, you're just not so worried about one. You're like, oh, I've got 10 on the go. It doesn't matter about that one. Mm. I have a great question from KP. Um, genuine question, not being arrogant. We don't think you're being arrogant at all. I can see how the process of painting could be very unique from person to person, but would that actually come through in the final painting? Absolutely. So life drawing class is a brilliant example of this. You get, say, 15 people standing around the same model using pencils and charcoal usually, and you get 15 completely different works of art. And I don't just mean the position of the model because you're standing at a different angle. I mean the way the lines are being drawn, the way the shading's being done, the, the accuracy, everything. Everything is different. So when you get people together you could see it last time I showed all the different work that was happening in the Facebook group everyone does different things naturally but when you make all those choices in your process so you maybe you decide I'm going to work with very very um, watery paint and inks and watercolors and I'm going to put them all together. I'm going to put my canvases on the floor. I'm going to drip my paint down and then I'm going to pool it and I'm going to pull it, pull the wet around and I'm going to learn how to mingle these media. So they're really exciting. I'm going to practice all the different effects I can get. I'm going to try putting bleach in it and see what happens. And then I'm just, this is all off the top of my head. And you do all this and you, you keep experimenting 
the result of all that experimenting and that process that you're developing is uniqueness. It, ca it can't not be because you and I might start out experimenting in the same way, but I will go off in this direction at some point and you will go in this direction. And what we end up creating from the same initial idea will be totally different. The only time that you do not get unique work is when instead of finding your own process, you're thinking, hmm, real artists do it this way. I've heard so-and-so does it this way. That must be the right way. I don't think it's right that I like to use a big, thick piece of charcoal for my lines. I think it should be more delicate, so I'm going to do it that way. I don't think it's right that I don't water down my paint, that I use it straight from the tube. So I'll change the way it feels natural to me. That's when we don't have a unique style because we're doing what someone else thinks is right. Um, any more questions on Facebook, Donna? I was just, um, Melissa said, I feel good and enjoy the marks if they look good. It's this working towards results. So I guess she's enjoying. Yeah. Oh, so she enjoys the marks if they look good. Um, it's sort of enjoying the process isn't it but it doesn't yeah it's, it's yeah. like what they look like as well yeah exactly it goes back to this feeling it's it's hard sometimes people get confused between there's nothing wrong with liking the look of what you made that's brilliant when you love what you've made it's really cool the problem comes if you beat yourself up on the days you don't like what you've made if you get too hung up on the positive days then the negative days are really bad and then you get down and then you get safe again and then you stop experimenting. So it's it's lovely to like what you've made. All we're saying is don't get attached to the idea of being good. Sometimes what happens to me is if I, I make a painting sometimes really quickly that just turns out and it's like, I don't know how it happened. It happened a few weeks ago with an abstract landscape. I was like, wow, that's so cool how that looks. And oh my God, and all the translucent layers and it just looks amazing. I'm going to do three more in the same style because that is the way I generally tend to think. Okay, do more, do more and see what happens. But if I'm not careful, I can get caught up in trying to reproduce the first thing because it was a success. So let's do that again. Let's do the same process. Let's do, and it doesn't result in anything good because what I have to do is go back to the mindset I had when I was experimenting, not, not the specific techniques or what I produced. So I don't know if that answers your question, but it's, if you're feeling good and enjoying what you're making, that's brilliant. As long as when you have a bad day, you're not beating yourself up. As long as you're not judging your success based on how the painting turned out, but you're judging it based on whether you put in a day, whether you advance something. To me, a successful day of painting is when I found something new, even a little thing, just some new thing to follow um, not whether I finished a painting or not. Um, someone had a watercolour tip there and it's just moved down on me. Ah, they go so fast on YouTube. How do you move on from copying others? Someone's saying exactly by doing what I've just described. By experimenting, by doing these assignments, by pushing yourself, by trying things out without any fear um audrey says when we started you said we would need three large pieces of prepared paper will there be more tasks yes there's two more tasks to come so i always want you to have three large pieces because that gives you enough to work on all these assignments the first day should have taken one big sheet and then the second day maybe half one of big sheets and then you've got two more exercises to go and the last exercise requires you to make a few little pieces so you'll need at least one big sheet for that and there's a good question because i relate to it um in facebook um basically they were saying any tips for getting the procrast can't say procrastination devil off my shoulder yes really it's about well the glib answer is yes go and do it 
just <laughs> like just go and do it um that I have to do that when it's my accounting time I hate doing my accounting I I would do anything other than come and do my books but I have to do it because my accountant's waiting it's the end of the tax quarter or whatever have to do it so I go do it art is a bit more optional isn't it there's nobody actually saying when are you going to send me your accounts I need them today but you can be that person but the the second thing I would say is it's helpful to figure out what's going on underneath the procrastination so if I I don't know what your favorite food is but let's say it's chocolate ice cream and I said we're gonna have some chocolate ice cream today you can have it whenever you want you wouldn't say to me, you know, I just keep procrastinating about getting that ice cream. I don't know why I can't make myself go get the ice cream, but for some reason, I just keep avoiding it. You would say, where's the ice cream? Yum, give me the ice cream. So it's the same with painting. Why, if it was fun, if you were enjoying it, if it was giving you joy and energy and exciting you, you wouldn't be avoiding it. You'd be dying to go there. When I avoid my studio is the same as when I avoid my accounts. No, it's a bit different. My accounts are boring, but also I don't know really know how to do my accounts. I'm not very good at it. The times when I avoid my studio are the times when I don't know what to do. That's when I start to procrastinate. I don't know what to work on if I go in there. So I'm just going to avoid it. In the case of this course, you do know what to do because you've got specific instructions. So if something is still niggling at you, it's because you're frightened you're not going to be good at it or because there's some internal judgment. So it might help if it doesn't help for me just to say, get up off your bum and go in and do it. If that doesn't help, maybe working out what you are actually worried about is you know, what is it you don't enjoy about painting? What are you making yourself do that isn't making it fun for you? And how could you let that go? And it doesn't happen overnight, but just I find it so helpful just to understand what's happening in our brain, getting it out of here and maybe writing about it, journaling. I procrastinate because, you know, just see what comes up when you write about it and try and go deeper on it. Yeah, I think I think I um, I personally procrastinate, and it's not because I don't enjoy painting. When I'm painting, I'm like, oh, why don't I start earlier? And I think it's probably because if you're painting something, I don't know, if I'm painting something as a gift and it needs to be good, I'm sort of scared of starting it because I want it to be perfect, so I put it off. Um, so that's one thing. But the great thing about and that's why I want originally, it to be perfect. You want it yeah. to be perfect, so you exactly. don't do it. Yeah. So, Whereas that's why it's really good to create deadlines for yourself because, you know, when it comes up to a deadline, I just think, oh, well, I'll just do anything. And it, and it always turns out better than I think, but then you think, well, I've just got to do something. Yeah. And that's why it's good with your course, just because it gave me, it gave me deadlines. I wanted to keep up with it and I wanted to get the most out of the course. So I thought, well, I'll just do anything. Just yeah. Yeah. It's great. And that's why I started painting a lot more uh, doing your course because I had a weekly deadline. And once you get over the procrastination the way Donna did, then you are getting better because the only way to not get better at painting is to not do it. As soon as you start doing it, you get better every single time. If you if you want to learn drawing and you start a sketchbook and every day you do a quick sketch of something, by the end of the sketchbook, you can't believe how much better you've got from the first drawing you did to the last one. That That is how this works. You also um, get more evidence that you enjoy painting because you've been painting more and you realise that every time... You make yourself start it. You actually really love feel it. better. Yeah. Claude above has a tip for procrastination. Uh, count down from 10 and then just do the thing. I don't know why it works, but it does. So you just go 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. Right. I'm going. Um, Jeanette says, I haven't done lesson two yet. It scares me for some reason. Again, I'm putting the onus back on you because when this free course ends, for those of you that don't carry on with me, you are back on your own and you need to have the resources internally to handle these things. So when you say it scares me for some reason, it's, it's your responsibility to go in and say, I wonder what the reason is. 
What's happening here? I liken this to, I've got a friend who I was talking to the other day and who said, well, that's just the way I am. I'm just, I'm just a bit selfish when it comes to that. That's just how I am. And I find that a, quite a shocking thing to say because I never say that's just how I am. I think, no, I wonder how, oh, I've noticed I'm being selfish. I wonder if I could be different in that situation. I wonder if I could work on that. But for a lot of people, and I'm not saying this is you, Jeanette, I'm using it as an example, but a lot of people will just say, well, that's just how I am. I'm no good with technology. Well, maybe it's not how you are. Maybe you're just telling yourself it is. Maybe if you made the same effort that someone who's good with technology made, you would be good with technology. And so with this, Jeanette, I'm saying it's your job to go back in and ask yourself, why am I scared? Because otherwise you, you won't do it. You'll just put it off. You won't do assignment three because let me tell you, tomorrow's assignment is a doozy. <laughs> it's going to take all your courage, all your um, mental reserves to do tomorrow's because we've led you in slowly into the most fun, if you let it be, the most fun thing you, you will do in painting. But for some of you, it will be also quite challenging. And if today's frightens you, tomorrow's you won't do. So you need to figure out, okay, what is it? What's happening here? What am I actually worried about? And then see if what you're actually worried about is, is a real thing. Um, for example, if you were worried, well, I heard that there's a uh, the special division of the police force that comes and arrests artists who make bad paintings and throws them into a windowless cell without any food and water, probably I'd be scared to get started as well. But if the thing you're scared of is, and I'm making it up now, but my my mum, who's been dead for 10 years, always said I wasn't a very good painter, then you can think, actually, th that's not something to be really frightened of. And you can make those baby steps to just do something. Maybe repeat the first exercise instead of doing number two. Maybe just do that again until you're feeling a little bit more confident. Uh, what else do we have in Facebook? Um, just checking back. If you have any questions, just put, if you could, I should have said this at the beginning, but if you type question um, before the question, that really helps us to work out what is a question and what someone else, help. What when you're helping someone else, because you're all, helping each other as well, which is fine. Louise um, um, that she has guilt about not being productive with her time. Like if the fin you know, if the, she puts too much expectation on the finished product, I think, because... Yeah, because of productivity. Yeah, but the thing is, so again, it comes back to, you have to get your brain to understand, and our brains can be really annoying, but you have to get your brain to understand that productivity in art doesn't come from pushing for a result it comes from the opposite so if you want to be the most productive imagine just being in your studio doing that squares exercise all day for like three days imagine how many paintings would be piled up all around you because you'd be super productive because you'd be free you do them in 20 minutes a time you start another one you start another one productive doesn't it doesn't come from trying to be productive. It comes from stopping trying to be productive. And what happens is you become so interested in the process that paintings kind of come out as a byproduct of what you're working on. But artists who are, who are successful artists, even when they have a gallery show coming up are not thinking, finish painting, finish painting. They're thinking, Ooh, what's happening on this paint? Oh, they might, of course, they're aware they've got a deadline, but that any artist who's worked to a deadline knows that if they start pressuring themselves to make finished paintings, it starts getting really hairy. Um, Lindsay says, can't seem to get past getting it right, how it's also in my life. So not in three days, Lindsay, because I'm guessing, and this is for everybody, I'm guessing that your desire to get it right and be a good girl or a good boy and please everyone 
is a very long standing thing, as you say, that's in your life as well, and probably comes from some time in early childhood. And so it doesn't just go away overnight. But what you are doing now by recognizing it is you're recognizing, wow, this desire to get it right is actually hurting my art making and my creativity. And I want to go on a journey to change that. And that might be with me, that might be some other way, that might be through YouTube videos, or meditations. I don't know who else teaches this stuff. It might be through uh, a creative counselor, but you, if you decide you want to change it, you can change it. It might just be through doing one experimental thing a day in your studio, allowing yourself to do one thing just for you for fun and letting it be anything it wants to be. And as the more you do that, the more you'll get better. Um, and there's someone who just wrote question, question in Facebook. It whizzed past me. So if you could just post that again, we'll, we'll have a look at it. Uh, what they wrote question. I, you can yeah. scroll back up again as you go. Look, um, I need to keep disappearing. Um. How to stop thinking about the outcome. I couldn't understand that question. I'm so sorry. Um, Carol, I was so frustrated and miserable after lesson two. Should I do it again before doing lesson three? Now, this course is called Find Your Joy. So I'm going to say no, Carol, because that sounds awful. But what I would do is just have a think about what the source of the frustration and misery was. Because all you were doing is taking some paint out of a tube and putting it on some paper at its most basic level. So something else was going on in your head apart from my, my assignment to you was to try as many different things as you could and just see what happened. So there was no judgment in my assignment, but somewhere between reading the instructions and, and you getting the materials out, something else came into play. What is that something else? You might really enjoy lesson three. You might really enjoy it or you might find it difficult. I can't tell. But um, don't make yourself do it again right now because we've got a new lesson coming tomorrow and you don't want to make yourself so miserable that you don't want to do this anymore. But it, it's just thinking about what's going on. Uh, Jan says, I'm scared of making a painting. I just want to play around. Is that OK? Yes. Go for it. You don't have to make paintings at this point. You never have to make paintings if you don't want to. But at some point, you just will because they're just going to come out of you as a result of what you're doing now. Even though that seems crazy, it's true. And um, thank you, everyone, who's just repeated the question question from Sari or Sari. Um, so they've asked, does it ever happen that you start on a painting, the one for lesson two that I attempted realistic landscape? And as I worked on the second one, I wanted to turn it into an abstract halfway through, which is their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. um, Does that ever happen to... Yeah, does that ever happen that you start on a painting, so trying to do something different from what they normally do, but then they wanted to turn it into... Yeah, yeah. I mean, that does happen, and that happens to me when I'm trying to move into new territory, but if my goal is to move somewhere new then I make myself cover it up again. Sometimes I'll, I'll realize I've started making this safe. I've started going back to what I know how to do, but that's not what I want. I want something else. But if you are, let me just say this caveat, if you are really happy in your comfort zone and it gives you joy and you like what you make, you don't need to change it. You only need to change it if you're here because you want to do more with your art or because you want to learn how to make unique art. Maybe you're already making unique art. I don't know because I haven't seen it. Um, and maybe you're happy with what you're making. So take your own happiness as the lead. If you feel frustrated with what's in your comfort zone, then you know what to do. When you feel yourself do that, just veer off and change it again. But if you're happy with it, stay with it it's all about what you want it's it's art is so different from everything else in our life it's about what we want 
Legacy asks how to find my own style when I think so many things are exciting, nice by doing what I'm saying. Right? I know I keep saying it, but by experimenting, by using different techniques, by trying different colors, by playing with things, by doing assignments, that's how you find your unique style. It doesn't come from looking at a bunch of paintings and saying, I want that style or that style, or I'm going to combine that style and that style. It's not a thinking thing and it doesn't come in a week. But the process for getting to it is to constantly try things, identify what you enjoy and keep doing that, identify what you don't like and drop that. That's it. That's all you have to do. And um, someone has asked, has said, um, I, it's Louise McLaren, I tend to hide my art from others. Is it important to let others see? And I remember uh, when I did your course the first time, um, it's kind of good. I find that when I'm painting, it's good to think you're not going to show it to anyone else. Because mm. if you go and show it to someone else, you kind of do it how you think they want you to do it in a way. Yes, yeah. You're right following what you actually enjoy and feel so whether you're going to so actually I didn't post anything on um I think I posted a couple of times in the Facebook group but I did nothing on my social media didn't show it to anyone till the end of the course because you know I just wanted to mess around and yeah not worry about, about what people think yeah I think that's a really good point you should do what feels good again um I do a podcast with another artist if you don't know it's called Art Juice and Alice, the artist I do the podcast with, we're very different in this. I tend to show everything on Instagram. Whatever I'm doing, I'll just take a picture and put it up. But Alice has a period of time in her process, usually in kind of in the middle. And then towards the end when they're getting finished, that she really doesn't like to share anything. And she never films herself painting because she doesn't like to share that private process, whereas I just film everything. And we're both doing what we enjoy and the way that works for us. Um, we both share our work at the end, but you don't have to. And certainly not now while you're learning and experimenting. When you see other people do it, it's because sometimes they really enjoy it. They like sharing their stuff and talking about it. So do what feels good to you. As Donna says, you might be one of those people who just want that private time to, to learn and grow and not feel like you're going to be judged and that is perfectly okay a few people are just asking if they've missed lesson one and two or um should they carry on with three tomorrow should they go back and catch up first um it's up to you uh, the lessons are not in a specific order in the sense that you have to have done them in an order but but i will just say that lesson three is a little bit more challenging for some people. Some people, it's their favorite thing and they do it all the time from now on. Some people find it more challenging. So uh, the first two are a nice prep into number three. But if you don't want to miss out, it's, you know, do what feels good to you. There is a catch up page. And in every email we send out, there's a link to go back and see anything you've missed. So you never have to miss anything. Um, but yeah, you decide. You there's no right or wrong in what you do there. Uh, um, Shushana, Shushana says, "Why does it make me feel? Why does it make me feel strange to post my painting and then check constantly how many have liked it?" Yeah, <laughs> I always and, yeah. That's why I and, don't like posting because then I get obsessed with how many people have liked it. Yes, yes. Like because I have quite a large following now, I'll tend to get quite a lot of likes on something. But occasionally there'll be something that gets less likes than usual. And it might be something I really like. And there's a little, even now, a little bit of me that goes, ooh, why didn't people like that one? Um, and But I can kind of tune it out now. I'm so experienced at it that it's only a little feeling. It doesn't actually change what I do. But in early days, it used to throw me off then. I'd think, oh, well, probably shouldn't do that anymore then because people didn't like it. So it's very normal to be checking. And also, I would say, keep in mind, in a group as big as we've got, most people do not see what you posted. Even Anne, who's one of our coaches, so in the group, she's marked as a moderator, which makes her, or an admin, I think, which makes her posts, in theory, more important. 
she posted something for everyone to see earlier in the week. And when I went and checked, only 912 people had seen it out of the 20,000 members. So, you know, and she's supposed to be an admin that's supposed to give her post more weight. So most of the time, very few people are seeing your post because of the way the group moves and the size of the group and also the Facebook algorithm. So all I would say is don't take it personally, but also don't beat yourself up that you want a little bit of validation because we do in the beginning. Um, Bold Painter says, do you experience, he's asking me, do you experience dry spells with your art? Uh, yes. And I am in one at the moment, partly because I'm very busy with this course and we've got some illness in my family and I've got some all sorts of personal stuff going on. So there's like no room in the day to squeeze in some painting as well. Um, but yes, I do definitely. And what I do is I keep going in sketchbooks or maybe I just occasionally make a bad painting, like do another bad layer on a painting and leave it. I try and keep going being creative, but, um, Sometimes work just takes over or I'm just not in the mood. And I allow, I just allow myself to be whatever I am. That's what I've found is the most effective. Um, Gail is asking, where can we learn more about taking other classes with you when the challenge is done? So don't worry, Gail, you will hear all about it on Friday when this course finishes. Sorry, I hope you can't hear my dog. He's losing his mind outside every single time I try and do this. My, my dog was too. That's why I muted myself. And then I tried to say something. I thought, why is she ignoring me? <laughs> Carla asked me if I could repeat the little story about stamping on the eggs. So I told a story, but I heard it on a podcast. I don't know what it was. Can you hear him? He's just absolutely losing his mind. I don't know what it is is now following someone up the drive. We can't, I can't hear him. It can't get out because the gates are closed, but okay, good. Um, so the story about stamping on the eggs was nothing to do with that actually, but I thought it was relevant. It was a therapy story. It was about a woman who had said to her therapist, I, I don't say this or that to my husband because it's like walking on eggshells around him. And the therapist said, why don't you just go walk on the eggshells and see what happens? And she did, and they ended up divorced, and she ended up out of a horrible relationship where she had to walk on eggshells. But by not walking on the eggshells, she was keeping herself trapped in that situation. So um, I feel like it pertains to this issue of artwork by the eggshells are your fear of what might happen if you take a risk. And I think just stand on the eggshells because what's the worst that could happen? It's not going to lead to a divorce. So that's the good news. If you don't want to get divorced, it's just going to be some broken eggshells and a failed painting possibly, or maybe a really good one. Uh, Facebook's full up of people telling you that they can't hear your dog. Good. <laughs> he's so loud. Honestly, he's out there just... <laughs> He stopped now. They must have gone. Whoever it was has gone away again. Um, just having a quick look here. Uh, there was another question that I missed, but there's so many questions and we apologize if we miss any. Someone asked if it's possible to submit questions in advance. And that would be the case. Again, when we do the, the 12 week course, we do that. And every single question gets answered on those courses. But we are teaching this for free. And we just simply don't have the, the resources, the number of people to read all the emails with pre-submitted questions in time when we're doing a Q&A live every other day. So um, it's not that we wouldn't love to answer every question, but we just can't. There's not that many of us. Uh, here was the question I saw from Stephanie. I'm fairly new. Which would make more sense during experimenting? to find one subject and do it in different media or to stick to one media and do different subjects. And honestly, Stephanie, either of those would be fine. It, either of those would be great. You are starting out, you are learning, 
you have so far to go and so many things to find out and so much excitement to come. When I say so far to go, some people think, oh, no, I have a long way to go. But every step of that journey is exciting. So I took, started to take my art seriously 10 years ago. And the first five years, I really didn't make much progress. But I made little bits of progress. And it was joyful all the time just finding the next thing I could do and some stress and some upset when I got rejected from shows and things and all that. But generally... It was exciting. So that journey you're on is such good fun. Just really enjoy it. If you're at the beginning, you'll never be at that beginning again. And it is it is the best time because you've got so much to learn. Um, No, just it's gone. Naomi was asking if you can't draw or paint realistic objects, does that matter? This is my first attempt at art. No, not at all. And as we were saying, if you want to do that, there are ways you can learn it, but you you don't have to. You don't have to. I personally think learning to draw is very helpful if you want to be any kind of artist, abstract or otherwise. But if it doesn't bring you joy and you don't enjoy it, you don't have to. Um, By Hawkins says, I am a musician and this all seems so messy and abstract to me. How do I make the transition from performance to abandonment? So well, I, I don't know much about music at all, but I am thinking that the mu- the I know as a listener, the producers I think of who create innovative work with their artists, Rick Rubin or Brian Eno in particular, Brian Eno created a series of cards and I've forgotten what they're called, but you can find them online. And they basically are prompts for musicians to, so he'll have a card and it'll say something like play it backwards or take all the instruments out except the drums or just really crazy things that he gets the the bands that he works with to do in order to push their work forward. Now, these are experienced musicians. Remember here, we're talking about learning to paint. When you were learning music, yes, there would be um, there would be scales and there would be music notes, and you can tell how musical I am. And there is in painting, there is composition, there is color, there is tone. But I believe that in order to learn anything creative, including music, you have to first learn how to be free and unafraid of failure. And that is all this is what we're talking about. We're talking about learning to be free and unafraid of failure before you start learning the basics. And then when you come to to know the basics, you will still be able to be free and be like a jazz musician improvising or be like one of Brian Eno's bands taking things to a different into a different direction because of something, some creative prompt. That is what this is. I don't know if that analogy helps. I hope it does. Um, Yeah, somebody, Torrid is mentioned in the book, The Creative Act, A Way of Being by Rick Rubin. Unbelievable book. I think it's the best book on creativity I've ever read. Rick Rubin, R-U-B-I-N, The Creative Act. It only came out last year, I think. Laura Haw says the Brian Eno cards are called Oblique Strategies. Thank you. I remember now. Oblique Strategies are the cards he used, and you can find them online on a website. Anna says, I got very upset during task two. Is this a good thing? Um, I don't know. (laughs) Um, What I said in the first call, and I do believe, is sometimes the way to find our joy is through some difficult emotions because we're so tight and tense and worried and concerned and we've got to overcome all that. So that sounds like what happened to you. I don't want you to feel upset all the time. So it's about how much you can handle and I don't know the situation. So I don't want to say, yeah, just go for it and be upset every day. If you want to send us an email, Anna, fyjteam at gmail.com or maybe post in the Facebook group if you're in there, that might be helpful. 
Um, and Nikki has asked an interesting question. Um, she said, what does taking a risk look like for each of you? For some reason, I find it hard to think of risks to take a lot of the time. So the risks to take in this course are in the instructions, but outside of this course, risk taking for me means going and doing something I don't know how to do. What about you, Donna? Yeah, something that I I don't know how to, that I haven't done before and that I don't think I'd like. Um, so I don't know, painting with a, like a big fat trowel rather than a paintbrush. Yeah. Or, um, the exercise, um, the recent exercise, when I did it um, a couple of years ago when I did the course, I did finger painting using unrealistic colours. And at the time I wasn't using, um, I mean, now I do use unrealistic colours as a result almost. Um, but at the time I used to like getting the colours true. So I used all these different blues. And I painted, um, it, it was actually a pet portrait <laughs> of, uh, if I used my fingers. And that was a massive risk to take. Um, yeah, it, and I did enjoy some of the stuff about it. Definitely, I really enjoyed the feeling of, you know, the paint and being, you know, the fingers. Although the result wasn't amazing, I really, yeah, enjoyed painting different things. Yeah, I mean, the the truth is that no good art was ever made in a comfort zone. Mm. In my belief, I really believe no exciting, interesting art was ever made in a comfort zone. So everyone's saying I went out of my comfort zone, that's why I wasn't happy. Being an artist kind of is about living a life outside of a comfort zone. And it's whether you want to do that or not. Um, and that applies to writers, musicians, probably gardeners, I don't know. You know, anyone who creates something is always going to be wanting to create something new and different, which means as soon as you get comfortable, for me, as soon as I get comfortable and I can make something easily, I want to go do something that's not comfortable because it gets boring. Um, yeah, you learn a lot. When I do a painting, I learn a lot through it. And therefore... Yes. I don't want to just repeat it again. Yes, exactly. I know I can do it kind of thing. Now we are right. We've been gone eight minutes over. So I'm going to look for one last question. If I see one last question, otherwise I'm going to um, call it a day. Uh, Louise says, isn't joy finding a new comfort? So I think they're two different things. I think the joy is the overall feeling. You could call it flow or, uh, you know, just just the general feeling of enjoyment of what you're doing and engagement and curiosity. And I only have that when I'm doing something interesting that I don't quite know how to do. So I don't get that from repeating myself. That isn't true of everyone, by the way. So again, there's no... There's no hard and fast rules here. I can only speak for myself. I can only share with you what I've seen help other people. But there are some artists who feel really happy and content just making things they know how to make and then selling them or giving them away or hanging them in their house. And that is nothing wrong with that. But I don't think you came to this course for that because it wasn't advertised that way and it wasn't promoted that way. So I think there's something in you that wants more than that. Uh, so Donna, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate you being here. This has been amazing. Thank you for your help with the questions. Uh -huh. um, if you asked a question in YouTube, unfortunately the live chat disappears when the YouTube video goes. You can leave questions under the recording the minute we stop. And on Facebook, the questions can keep coming in on the post and your questions are there. So we will circle back, all of us, the coaching team, to see we missed any questions. But I know Irene and maybe others, I noticed Irene was in there busily answering away. So thank you to anybody that's in there helping out and answering. Uh, but we'll try and make sure all of your questions get answered in one way or another in those comments. And if you're on YouTube and you have a question that didn't get answered, as I say, wait till we turn off the live and then you'll be able to leave a regular YouTube comment on there. 
All right, Donna, thanks so much. All right, thank you. Bye, everyone.